Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, June 2nd. We are continuing our study of the Gospel in the Stars. A quick, very quick review of just last week. We were in Scorpio. Scorpio is that scorpion, that evil one who wants to try to destroy the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman we know as Messiah himself. In our first decom, we saw the serpent, called serpents or serpent, struggling in Ophiuchus's uh, grasp. Ophiuchus is the serpent bearer. He's holding onto the serpent on in both of his hands, and you see from the way he's holding it that the serpent is going down in defeat. The serpent is not winning the battle. The serpent is losing. As he's losing, oh good, thank you, Roger. I didn't think to ask you to do that. He's got the chart up for you to see it. As he's losing the battle, the tail, if he was winning, would be circling around, coming toward his head, and you would see it encircling Ophiuchus to strangle him. That's what's not happening, but the serpent is still trying to grasp at that crown just above him, Corona Borealis, and he wants to seize the crown away from the glory of the Lord who it belongs to. We read about that in Yeshia, Isaiah 14, the battle right from the get-go, Tom wanting to be like God, and he loses even his kingdom, which I believe is this earth. Uh, it was given then to man. Man fell because Satan wanted his kingdom back, wanted to usurp what God had planned with the man, and for a time is a prince of the power of the air. But we're going to see Scorpio, the evil one whose intent is against Messiah, will be the one who is crushed in defeat. Reminds us of Genesis, Bereshit 3.15, the first prophecy in scripture. We get it right after we've talked about creation. That's how quick on the scene it is to the prophetic word of our Messiah, who would be the seed, who would come, who would give the death blow to Satan. All Satan would manage to do is bruise his heel. That's the picture of crucifixion. But that was what the Lord willingly allowed to be bruised was his human body so his blood could be shed placed on the mercy seat in the holy heavenly uh, tabernacle so that we could go into the presence of our God one day. <clears throat> so we do definitely have a mighty warrior in Ophiuchus who is uh, winning the battle. And remember the brightest star in his head is the head of him who holds and Messiah is the head. He is the head of the called out assembly nowadays. He is the head of Israel. We have um, the, the Lord coming to rule and reign in victory on earth, even as he is in heaven. It is not that he's lost control down here, but he's allowing evil to run its course, using it for his purposes. That's why he even uses evil leaders that are raised up, evil circumstances. And one day, all of that, the sting of death, the sting of sin, it will be gone. Hallelujah. The star in the foot talked of Ophiuchus um, on the meridian line there, the ecliptical, I'm sorry, on the ecliptical path. The foot has the star that, that talks about being bruised, but you see the foot is raised in victory, ready to come down and crush the head of um, the serpent, I mean, I'm sorry, of Scorpio uh, and right. the, the scorpion, the scorpion. We're still talking Scorpio, and uh, it's the same whether it's crushing his head or his heart, it's going to be a death blow. <coughs> Um, then we saw the, the man who, um, Hercules, who is the strong one, the mighty man. Um, the Hebrew name is Gabor, and uh, that we know is a name for the Messiah, and we see him, there we go, we see him in victory. Even though he's kneeling, he's the one that's upside down above Ophiuchus in your picture. Even though he is kneeling, that's the humbleness, that he humbled himself taking on human form, but in his hands, the club, is showing he's got the upper hand in victory, and the other hand, he is either ready to clobber the three-headed dragon, which is a picture of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself, or if you look at it to be fruits, then it is the evil fruits versus the fruits of the Spirit that are going to be put down <coughs> and done away with. He's wearing a lion's skin. The lion reminds us of the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who is victor, the king of the... Well, that's king of the jungle, but we know as king, period. King, he is king of kings and lord of lords. It is interesting, I brought out a, um, a different view slightly of Hercules last, year from, last week from Greek mythology, uh, because you have different views. Another view is that Hercules was the son of Zeus. Zeus was supposed to be the king of the gods. And so Zeus came together with a mortal woman by the name of Al. Alcmene, I can't say it anyway. Zeus was always chasing one woman or another. 
took on the form of her husband, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. He visited her one night in her bed, and this is how Hercules was born. So he's part god, part man. He's a demigod with incredible strength and stamina. Do you see the warp right there? Part god, part, part man, a demigod having this power. You can see, they say that, that we Christians, because Christianity came later, took from Greek mythology, but I'll take you back earlier than that. The roots of Christianity are in Judaism. You go back in time, all the way back into our prophets. Long before Greek mythology, you have the promise of the one who would be fully God and fully man coming into this earth because he had to take on human form to redeem humankind. So all, all Greek mythology does is take a bit of truth and warp it. All the astrology does is take a bit of truth and warp it. All that Satan ever does is take a bit of truth and warp it. So I tell you, go back, go to the original, go to the root, and find the truth. And we see that as we come into Sagittarius, almost where we left off last week. Sagittarius is reminding us of the Redeemer's triumph, the coming one who goes forth conquering and to conquer. He's coming up on the screen here now. He is, again, one that shows a dual nature. He's got the, archer, the archer's bow. Uh, Sagittarius means the archer. It's the bow that's going to uh, shoot Scorpio in the heart, no. do away the, the, the blow to do away with the scorpion. Again, that's the blow to sin. It's the blow to death. That will be gone. He will be victorious. Now, when we talk very soon, we're going to go into Capricornus. When we talk about that one, we're going to talk about a bow that is there. I don't want you to confuse it with this bow. This is the hunter's bow in the hunter's arch being aimed at the... Somebody doesn't have audio. Uh-oh. Mary Lou, she just came back in again. <clears throat> okay, so I'll let you deal with it then. Thank you. Sorry, it just popped up in my face, so I <laughs> thought I was supposed to pay attention. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, we're going to talk about a different bow, a different kind. We'll see the difference in Capricornus. So when I refer to the bow, which I think we'll get to in this class, don't confuse it with the bow of Sagittarius. Uh, this, this is the bow that you see in the archer who is shooting it at Scorpio to take him out. Sagittarius is in the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It's the largest constellation in the southern hemisphere. The brightest stars are called, uh, in our English, gracious one, going forth, two natures. All of this are in the names uh, of this one. And the fact that it's on the ecliptic path, that's the path of the sun, we know that, that the prophecy from Malachi, last week I misspoke and said Micah, it's Malachi, Malachi, chapter 4 and verse 2, the, the son, S-U-N, of righteousness would rise with healing in his wings. I think it's very interesting to note that on the path of the sun, this one is rising in righteousness, and notice he's winged. So it's just an inter <coughs> interesting play on the words. Um, it's not that I believe that the Lord is coming with with wings, but we know the son of righteousness, S-U-N of righteousness in Malachi, Malachi, is a play on the name of the God, uh, man who is the son, S-O-N, capital S-O-N, the son of righteousness. The Greeks called him ex executor because he was the chief centaur um, dealing righteously. We saw other centaurs were not righteous in their dealings, but this one was. That took us into Sagittarius's three decons, and we looked at the first one. It was Lyra or Lyre, depending on which source you read from. It is the harp. The harp is on the body of the eagle. No, go up. Go up. It's going to be inside. There it is. See? Oh, yeah, there you go. Upside down, but there. Um, and you, we showed pictures last week. We're not taking the time now, but as we go into the new ones, Roger will call up the pictures You know, for our new when ones. When you want it, you know. I'm sorry? You want it? It doesn't matter. This is good enough for now okay. because it's just review. But we saw that praise was prepared for the conqueror. For this one, Sagittarius, who's conquering, praise was for him. Um, the first time, Alleluia, Alleluia, Hallelujah, praise to God. The first time in the New Covenant that it's given is in Revelation 19. We make it all the way to the last book. Revelation 19, 1 to 3, and we see that the hallelujah comes out because 
judgment has been executed. Satan has been put down and it has been brought, his kingdom has been brought to end. It's when he's going to be thrown into the abyss for the thousand year millennial reign of Shalom, of peace. The first time hallelujah is used in our original covenant is also praise for judgment on the wicked. It's in Tehillim Psalm 104 and verse 35. It's the first time it's used. Then it's used a number of times. I think if I remember right, it's 24 times. If I'm saying it wrong, whatever I said last week is right. Um, the majority of which are in the book of Psalms, which are praises. Psalm 146 to 150, every single one of them starts with hallelujah, praise to the Lord. Most of them end with that also. I'm going to draw our attention quickly to Psalm 148 again because it is so fitting. I think we're all seeing it on a new level it's while we're studying the gospel and the stars. We know that the heavens are declaring the glory of God and that's what this psalm says. Verse 1, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly armies. Praise him, sun, moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens. It goes on all the way through, just continues to praise him. But do you not see a new level on all of that praising God in a new way that we're seeing? And then as uh, Naomi started to bring out for us, she caught, and I had seen it also, it says, praise him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. We both had, had thought before, and I think a lot of us do when we talk about creation, and we will be going back to Genesis after this study, and we'll get into the depth of creation again because we'll go back to the beginning. It's been too long to expect us all to remember what we studied before. But I think we focus on the waters that he separated on the face of the earth. But he does make it clear that he separated the waters in, in the heavens with what's on the earth. And it sounds like there's still water in the heavens. I bring that out because in our view of the new heavens and the new earth, we know that we're told there's no more sea because the sea was prison house for, for demons, for false um, uh, angels that, that followed Satan. But it doesn't mean that there's no water. We know there's the sea of, of glass that we know goes out from the throne. We know that it, it at least is personified by water if it is not a running stream of some sort. Uh, but it's interesting that, that there's some sort of waters in the heavens <coughs> also. I bring that up because I just want us to realize we can't exhaust the Word of God. We can't catch it all. We can't understand it all. When I bring you out that there's a universe 38 million light years away from here, let it blow your mind. Because if your God is small enough for you to understand and to know him entirely and figure him out, you've got a God that's too small. There's no way a human will ever be able to attain a godly knowledge. So um, I wonder how much more in the heavens. When we go flying by these things, are we going to say, wow, we were in kindergarten, we were in preschool, and here we thought we got this, the corner on the market. We thought we had come into something and caught on to something. And don't let that discourage you. It just tells me how awesome, how ineffable our God is and that uh, he is at work in amazing ways. And let that encourage you when you think you know your circumstances and you can't understand why the Lord isn't doing this or so or, or rescuing at the time you think this, this same God who's made a creation beyond our imagination is the God who's at work in our circumstances there's no sea also. Life, and there's a lot of beautiful sea life. Beautiful and fish. he created the sea life. So, uh, and he created that sea life. Yes, so, who knows? And if it's who fresh knows? water, we may have have fresh water fish. And it'll be you totally different. And I, I do not believe that you're going to see a fishing pole in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's some tombstones that says, "I'm going to I'm going to be fishing in heaven." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and did you have a question? You need to unmute yourself. Oh, I got to you can't do it. Yet. Oh, you can't do it. Roger's doing it. Okay. She's down there. You had her. You were on her and you went away. No, but I, I got to get the working on you. Oh, hello. I didn't know you were here. I thought you were gone. <laughs> okay, and, oh, not quite. There we go. Okay, uh, just real quick, uh, please, the song number. 
the number of the psalm that says, Praise Him, Sun, Moon, and, and New Heights of Heaven. What was that one? 148. Start with verse 1, but by the time it gets to the sun and the moon yeah. and all of that, it's verses yeah. 3 and 4. Okay, but, and then the psalm for waters above the heavens, that's number is what? That's the that same one, it's 148 oh. verse 4. That's okay, psalms. thank you. Yes. Psalm, yeah. Yeah, Tehillim Psalm. Okay, so that's where we, we left off last week was with our hallelujahs, and it is amazing. And now we are coming into the second decon. I think, yeah, we did the first. We did just the first, right? Uh, oh, I, that's my problem. I'm looking at my review for what's coming up. That's not going to help. Well, you did the. Okay, Lira. I had it. I know we did. We did liar, Lyra. Lyra. Right. Okay, and so the second decon is Ara, the uh, the altar, and that's where I need to find. Where did I go? Because that's where we are. Sorry, I put my note in for Friday night, and I forgot to move it for today. Uh, okay, I, I was looked at the archer. Here's Lyra. I found it. Okay, and also, if you want to see where the Lyra is used in praise, I think I brought it out last week, but in case if I didn't, I will read it for you, but it's Psalm 33 and verse 2. To Halim... 33 and verse 2, my tablet slow today. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre, or the lyre, whichever way you pronounce it. Some spell it with an E on the end, some spell it with an A on the end. Anyway, so that's where we get that musical instrument is used in praise. By the way, we saw that it was on the eagle, and we saw how God uses the eagle in Scripture. Um, we saw a lot from that. I won't go into all of that now, but, but just that it's a symbol of strength and of power. It's considered the king of the sky. We t talked about how the eagle takes care of her young, and we, we recognize the picture of the Lord in that to us, Isaiah 4. 30, 31, the mount with wings like eagles. We talked about that a bit. Um, the vision of the eagle, all of that. You know, we looked at that all last week. And uh, so I don't want to go into it now, but just, you know, reviewing, getting our minds there, that how awesome our God is, worthy of our praise from the highest heavens to the lowest depths of the, this, whatever, the sea, the heart of the earth, wherever you want to go. Um, it all, and one day, all will praise the Lord. Now we're looking at Ara, the altar, and um, it's going to be down south, Roger. It's going to be, it looks like an altar upside down. And once you've shown it on that chart here, maybe I can help you. It's all the way Outside down, the way down, yes. There you go. That? Yes, that. Um, and it looks like it got cut off in our yeah. picture there, but no worries because Roger's going to call up the other pictures that I sure. have and he will show you Aura there. Remember, we see the pictures in outline form only in the reality of the stars in the sky. Somebody connects the dots and says, oh, this looks like the scorpion, like there. You can see the line of stars and they form the scorpion shape around it to help us understand what's being played out by the names that are given to us. We don't know with authenticity where all these names came from. We just know what's been passed down, and we know where it uh, um, it teaches us what it's showing. See, here's what they would see in the stars. Someone saw in that, okay, I can see an altar shape. Let's see if that fits, because when we look at the names of those stars and what they mean, it gives us um, that more complete picture. So. Ara, the altar, is a picture of a consuming fire, and that's why when he shows you another view, it will be upright instead of upside down. We'll talk about why it's upside down in a moment. But it's going to look like the altar that you would think of from Bible times, that the fire is on the altar. It is consuming its enemy. Roger, can you call up the next picture? Are you too busy trying to help somebody get in? <laughs> Poor guy. We don't give him any rest. Not this, right? There you go. See, that looks more like the altar oh, that we were used to in the tabernacle um, or, you know, when they were taking their sacrifices to the temple. Um, what we're seeing, though, again, the point of this is that it is a consuming fire on the altar. It will burn up its enemy. When we read Matthew, Matthew 25, uh, I'm going to take us to verse 41. I always want to say 40, but I think it's verse 41. I'll tell you for sure in a moment. Uh, okay, it is verse 41. 
Is Yeshua Jesus speaking? When we're in Matthew 25, we've come through the tribulation. We are looking at the setting up of the kingdom. We have the judgment, the shepherd who will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are those who have come into his righteousness. They will go into the kingdom. The goats will be cast out. When we see that happening, the goats that are being cast out, this is Yeshua speaking of them. In verse 41, he says, Then he will also say to those on his left, Bless you. That's not what he says. <laughs> but I have to say, Lord, bless you. He says, Depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire. Okay, so these goats aren't, aren't real goats. It's the representation of the goat is the one who, who was at odds with God. And he's telling them, depart from me. They're being cast into the eternal fire. Lest you think, well, that was a mean God who planned this. He tells you the reason why there was an eternal fire. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's who God intended to cast out was the one who came against him in pride and did not want to be in his presence, wanted to dethrone him. He, we, we would see, is worthy of being cast out into eternal suffering. But the, when man ends up there, it is man's choice. No one can ever point a finger at God and blame God. No one can ever say, it's your fault, God, I'm here. He will show how he reached out throughout time, no matter whether you were born in Adam's day or born in 2021, that he was there reaching out in his love. He did it all. He made it a free gift. You had to simply just accept it, and it, it, that was it. You just you, you chose not to. So the same way the shepherd would lay down in the front of the sheepfold to protect the sheep all night, it's as if that's a picture of the Lord laying down his life and any who end up outside are because they've chosen. Basically, they, 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 they have refused the body of the Lord. They've refused his protection. They've refused his blood. They have chosen to put themselves into this place of eternal uh, torment by their choice. The, he, the um, Hebrew word, or, or I'm not sure it's Hebrew, but the other word for this is gamar, G-A-M-A-R. I say Hebrew because it makes me think of gamara, which is, uh, or it comes close to Gehenna, which is the burning fire in Hebrew. But anyway, the meaning of it is to come to an end, to complete, or to perfect. Even in God's perfect plan, he has to do something with evil. It cannot be allowed to run its rampant course forever it, there has to come a judgment there has to come a time when evil is called up and it's, it, it receives its just dues and really we can hardly wait for that we don't like seeing the injustices done in this earth continually read your newspaper turn on a news i don't care what country where you are on the face of this earth you'll hear something very quickly that will make your heart want to cry out for justice you want someone stopped from bringing harm to others. Uh, so we understand, again, this is by their choice, but it is righteous judgment, and they are worthy of it because they have refused the uh, shed blood. They've refused the robe of righteousness. They've refused what would bring them that right relationship with God where they could be seen uh, as uh, holy in his presence. There are nine stars to, um, and you can begin to see the line in there that's connecting the nine. Nine stars to form this altar. Some call it a burning pyre, P-Y-R-E, if, if you know how they, the, those who burned with fire on the pyre, you can see why from the picture why they're saying that. It's burning upside down with this fire pointing down toward the lower regions of, of the <coughs> earth. That's in essence pointing to the Greek word Tartarus. Abyss is another word, it's outer darkness, the idea that that complete judgment is how they are cast out, that they will not remain in the sphere of our world. The Greeks use that name Ara, A-R-A, as uh, the sense of imprecation. It was calling on it a curse that invoked evil on a person doing evil. So it, it was like that's what they deserved because they were doing evil, that curse should come on them that would stop them from inflicting their evil on others. In Hebrew, it would be Mara or Aram, and again, it was a curse or an utter destruction. Originally, Ara was on the lowest horizon of the south. We see how far south in our chart that it is. 
And again, that's the, to represent the underworld, the regions beyond. The idea is, is that that's outer darkness is cast away. Um, they're thrust into those regions of darkness. We read about it in Matthew 25. Let me read to you in Revelation 12, because remember God said in Matthew it was prepared for the devil and those who followed him, the, his fallen angels. We read of this in Revelation 12, verses 9 and 10. And a great dragon was thrown down. This was out of heaven. The war was raging in heaven, verse 7. Verse 9, the great dragon was thrown down. The serpent of old, old who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. We're not given any chance to guess who this is. If you don't know him by the name of great dragon, you certainly would know when he's called the devil or called Satan. We know he's the one deceiving the world. He was thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. But now it's going to be even lower than that. Verse 10, then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Messiah have come for the accuser of our brothers and sisters, the one accusing us before God. He has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. <coughs> this is when the, the blood of the Lamb comes, well, the Lamb comes, and he stops the, the battle, and Satan will be uh, put into the abyss. That's the start of Revelation 20. We will see that. That's the time that it's being referred to. So we know that's a future prophecy still yet to be fulfilled because no one can say Satan is not at work on the face of this earth today. Again, turn on the news. The third picture in our decons for Sagittarius is Draco the dragon. And you are going to see him. I looked these all up last night, and I'm just trying to remember. He's down low also. Um, okay, I've got to, where's Sagittarius? I'm in the wrong place. Here we go. Okay. Where did Draco go? I'm sorry. I had it. I knew it before, and now I've forgotten. It's up, it's up, up uh, from the little arc. Where the foot of the man is. Where the foot of the man is. Okay. Oh, 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 yeah, in the middle. I was looking too low. Go toward the middle, Roger. There you go. There you go. You're almost okay. on Draco. Right there. Okay. You see that the head looks like a serpent's head, or it could be the dragon. Think of the dragons that, you know, that breathe fire. It could be a picture of that. Okay, so about in the middle, there he is. See it? Okay, look in the middle. Yeah, is another one that, that represents Satan that's down where I was looking. I, when you study ahead, you get in trouble. <laughs> okay, Draco is the dragon. He's the old serpent. He's the devil cast down from heaven. This is review, so I won't go into the full meaning, but look again. This is Isaiah, Yeshia, chapter 14. And it starts out being against the king of Tyre, but we see it goes far beyond. Whoops, I plugged in the wrong... There we go. Isaiah 14, we're going to look at verse 12. Um, Yeshia, our prophet Isaiah 14, verse 12 says, How you have fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn. We know that Satan was created beautiful. He was created, the, the, um, not the great and morning star that we know is the name for Messiah, but we see he had a great beauty. He had a headship that was there, but he's fallen from that position. He's been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. He came and he deceived and defeated many of the nations. This is the one that's cast down. Verse 15 shows us, nevertheless, you'll be brought down to Sha'ol, to the recesses of the pit. This is where Satan will end up. Um, this is what it is referring to. When we see Sha'ol, this is to the suffering component or tank that uh, the paradise side had been emptied out but he's being brought down to the recesses of the earth he is put into the abyss into the pit of suffering during the millennial then he will be cast in the lake of fire in the outer darkness forever yes Dor. can i ask a question uh this uh little phrase always gets me the star of the morning mm -hmm. and then when, it, when you say uh the Messiah, great and morning star the morning star right it sounds similar i think if we could get into the ancient hebrew we would see even more of a difference but when when it's referred to as the great and morning star we know it was referring to messiah in context and when we hear here you're the star of the morning it's it's a lesser but it's still one of the brighter stars but it's not meaning the great the the 
the ultimate. So it, it is hard to see in our English. Remember, our English is poor. I love chocolate cake, and I love my mom. And if you think I love those two equal, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> okay? So, again, in our English, we, we lose some of that. That would give us more of a depth and more of an understanding. And, yeah, it causes more than just you to stop and say, well, wait a minute. But you look at the context, keep it in context, and you can tell clearly who it is referring to. The ancient Hebrew word for Draco the dragon is tanin, which means dragon or serpent. And like I say, in the constellation, the way it's drawn, one draws it more like a dragon breathing fire, one draws it more like a serpent. Either one is fine. What we're going to see is, um, remember we've got three books. Our first book concludes with the dragon being cast down from heaven. That's where we are right now. We're concluding that first book, and we're seeing he's cast down from heaven. Our second book is going to conclude with a, the icon called Cetus. It's, I'm sorry, C-E-T-U-S. It's the sea monster, and we're going to see the sea monster bound. Okay, that makes me think of the, the millennial thousand years when Satan will be bound in that bottomless pit, not allowed out. The third book is going to conclude with Hydra, H-Y-D-R-A, and that's the old serpent. That's the one I was going for instead of Draco by accident. We're going to see that one destroyed. So first he's cast down from heaven, then he's held in the abyss, and finally he is destroyed from ever being able to come into our realm ever again. I love that we see the total victory. Uh, Draco has 80 stars. The Hebrew is darach, whether I'm saying it right or not. It means to tread or the trodden one, which makes us think of Tehillim Psalm 91. Psalm 91, very familiar psalm to many. We're going to go to verse 13. And in Psalm 91 and verse 13 we read, You will walk upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. He is going to be trodden on. He is not in that position now. He inflicts his damage on us, uh, or on human, I should say, on mankind. But there will come the day when he will be the one trodden on. <clears throat> the brightest star in Draco, <clears throat> in one of the latter coils, the curly cues, is Thuba, T H U B as in boy, A N. <clears throat> Thuba means the subtle one, and we know he comes with subtlety. That's how he deceived Eve in the garden. The Hebrew name is Arun, and we see this all, all the way back. This is Genesis 3. Okay, in Genesis 3, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, okay, my tablet doesn't like to go today. There we go, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God really said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? He's starting to sow in doubt right there. If you need more fam, you can do more fam too, okay? So um, right there, right from the, the beginning, we see he's subtle, he's cunning, more cunning than all the others. He came and he deceived Eve, okay? Now, this is very interesting, and it gets a little technical for me to explain, but I'll do my best for you. Thuban, for 4,620 years, was known as the polar star. From 3,942 B.C. to 1793 B.C. So from the 4th millennium to the 2nd millennium B.C., this Thuban was also called the polar star. <clears throat> the, world, the world revolved around the subtle one, okay? Because we have, the, you know, the elliptical path, we know that, that there's revolving going on. The North Star was called as it sits in the direction that the spin axis from the North Hemisphere of the Earth points. We know the North Star is fixed in such a way that the nautical, um, those from the seas that were using the stars would, would use that as their fixed point, okay? So th that's our North Star, that's our Polar Star. Presently, the star known as Polaris 
the North Star, okay? That's the one, and again, here's where it gets technical, but the spin axis of Earth undergoes a motion called precession. That's a very slow movement around the axis of a spinning body around another axis due to a torque such as gravitational influence and is acting to change the direction of the first axis. So we've got a, a, a pull here going, okay? And that's why the polar star isn't now where it was then. Where it was then was in Draco, in the subtle one. So it was like, it's showing a picture of the subtle one controlling the world, in essence, is the underlying picture that we're seeing. Okay, now, when we get to Cancer, we'll go into far more detail than we're going to now, but I wanna give you the other side of that picture at this point. Cancer is when it looks like a crab. We're going to see that it, even though it looks like a crab, it probably would have been better to look at it as being a sheepfold. And if you know the sheepfolds in ancient time, they were often in that shape. Even when it was a cave being used, you would see the cave with just the one opening. The cancer's that crab that's ready, you know, there's just that one opening that the claws are coming together, okay? Now, in cancer is where the polar star is now. And when we get there and we study the meaning of cancer, we're going to see the sheep or the sheepfold, and we're going to see by the name of the stars, one of the stars in there refers to it as the hiding place. The shepherd's fold, the sheepfold is the safe place. The one who controls the sheepfold is the shepherd. We know who the great shepherd is. So when you see a move from Satan, the dragon, being the fixed point that the world's revolving around to now it's moved into the picture that's showing the sheepfold that the shepherd is controlling, keeping safe, is a hiding place. What we're looking at, I believe, is another indication how we have moved on God's time pattern, uh, time pattern, that's wrong word, time, down through the quarter time, we're moving into where no longer will Satan be the prince of the power of the air. His power will be gone, the dragon will be completely defeated, and the one who will be in control is the shepherd who has us in his sheepfold for safety. We're going to see also very, very interesting, there is a large and there is a small. You're used to calling this the Big Dipper and the Small Dipper, some call it Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, which are the bears, but bear is not the right. I'll show you why it's not the right picture to draw also when we get to Cancer, but uh, I just, I just had to go, wow, to see how slowly this moves. It moves by the torque. It moves by that uh, gravitational pull that the Lord has put into our, our system that gives us our seasons. It gives us the, the pull on the earth uh, so that we don't float off into outer space, all of that, so we don't feel upside down when we are upside down, <laughs> all of that, which is amazing. But to see that this, this fixed point, star, this most important star for um, direction it has moved into the sign that's going to show us the shepherd and safety in the sheepfold. I find that very interesting. I see Satan in defeat. Hallelujah. There's no cancer on this. No, we're not yet that far yet. Yeah, you're on page three. I don't know what page it'll finally show up on. Cancer is number 11. So we got to get all the way from, we're in Sagittarius number four, we've got to get all the way to 11. I don't have my notes done all the way through, so you don't have your outline yet, <laughs> but it will come. And that's why when we get there, I'll be explaining more of this, but I wanted to give you that overview because I think that's such a blessing to hear it and to see it. I loved it, so I wanted to share it. Rowena, question, and Roger, you need to unmute her, please. And if it gets too hard to hear me because we do have outside noise, please let me know you're not hearing. Hopefully, prayerfully, we're not going to have a problem. But go ahead, Rowena. Are, are you saying that that North Star, because the stars are moving, is sometimes during the year is part of the dragon, and then sometimes of the year it's part of the cancer? No, no. I'm saying that through the course of time, through thousands of years, the polar star, even though we call it fixed and we say it doesn't move, it actually is moving very, very slowly because of the torque, this 
this pool that I tried to describe that's, that's scientifically hard to understand is caused the, the polar star to move slightly through space in that time. And it's moved from being in Draco, which shows the dragon being in control of the, the direction of the earth, to now it's in the sheepfold that the shepherd's in control of over the earth. So to me it's showing Satan's got his power now. He's a prince of the power of the air. We know that Ephesians 6, but in time we will see his total defeat. We know it's about 6,000 years of mankind from Adam to us today. Well, 4,000 to 2,000 millennium, it was in Draco and then it's gradually moved, we've gone past 2000 BC to 2000 AD, we've gone 4,000 more years, it's just moved slightly to where it's now a part of the, the sign we see in Cancer. So, yeah, it's just, just a fascinating detail. A little hard for us to understand because we don't really catch all this movement, there, maybe if you've got a better scientific mind than I you do, but uh, I can understand enough to say, okay, I get it. We're seeing, again, a picture of Satan's defeat. The dragon's gone down. He's lost his power. He's lost his control. He's not the, the prince anymore. And the shepherd has come up, and he is the great shepherd, the shepherd who, the chief shepherd, who will rule forever and ever, and he is the one who has that control. So um, if you don't get it fully now, hang on. Maybe when we get into cancer, it will fully... Um, come together for us at that point in time. It's also interesting that even though this polar star is so important to navigation, to us, you know, in this, one source says that it was a relatively inconspicuous star in the night sky. It's 270 light years from the Earth, is estimated to be five times brighter and nearly double the size of its stellar companion. Oh, I forgot to... Um, <laughs> Um, Roger, tell him that we've got a class being recorded, and can you get the envelope off of the counter to pay him? Um, give him 45, okay? No, there's more in there than that, just give him the 45. Okay, thank you, sorry. You should have answered the door, maybe he ran. I'm sorry, I, usually our gardener is not here and I don't have to take care of him during class. Everything <laughs> comes to interfere, but... Uh, um, hopefully it won't interrupt too much. Um, shadow, shadow, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay, sweetie. Thank you. Sorry to put you out again, Roger. Uh, she's going to want to go with you. Watch out. Okay. Okay. Shadow, come here. Come here, sweetie. Good girl. <laughs> okay. We, we appreciate protection. <laughs> Shadow, it's okay. It's okay. See, the big bad wolf ate up her daddy. He went out the door. <laughs> so my apologies. If she stays quiet, I'll go on. Um, are you all too warm in here? Yes? You're okay. Okay. It's starting to, yeah. If it gets to be too much, Medina, you know how to do it. You can flip it, flip it on. Okay. It makes a noise, so. Yeah, that's why we're trying to do it now, but I also don't want people falling asleep on me because it's hot or miserable and not wanting to come back. So, okay, I think she's going to quiet down. I think I can go on. Um, it is the fourth brightest star in Draco. It's the eighth largest constellation in the night sky. So even though it's the fixed star and this most important, it's not the brightest it's not that that's how they picked it out. It's because of that fixed position that it appears to have because it is moving so slowly, where other stars are moving much more rapidly. You know, we, we know we see different stars at different times of the year. Now, Lucifer does mean day star, not the great morning star. We talked about that already, but it does, does mean day star. And we see that he is the god of this world. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. And I will read that for you in just a moment. Thank you so much, Roger. Sorry to put you out. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Messiah, who is the image of God. 
We talk about that, that, that those who have come to believe in the Lord have come to the light, is sometimes how it is said. We know that, that Satan, as we read in Genesis 3, came to deceive. We know that, that he blinds the eyes, that's what it says here, or the minds, so that the unbeliever will not see. That's why there is a battle for an unbeliever to come to saving faith. It's not that they just hear once and, oh, okay, I get it, I believe it. It's because Satan tries to steal it from, from their understanding. He tries to deceive. He counterfeits. He, he brings up the lies, and the world falls for that. The individuals who do not, it's because the Spirit of God is also tagging at the heart of that person. And when they yield to the Spirit of God, the, the Spirit of God enlightens them. They come to know the truth. Yeshua said, you, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. That's John 8, 44. Earlier than that, he had said, I am the way. What's he the way to? He's the way to the Father, the way to God. I am the truth. He, that's where we see. So when he says the truth will set you free, knowing Yeshua, Jesus sets you free. What are you free from? You're free from the lie of Satan. You're free from being bound in your sin to suffer the consequence of death. That's what's promised. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua. Through the one who says he is the truth, the one who says he is the way, the one who will bring you into that relationship with Jehovah. But Satan is, is wanting to snatch everyone that he can and take them away from the truth, away from the light. And we saw him start with Adam and Eve right there in the garden. Got them to, to question God's word put a, a seed of doubt in their mind and worked on um, Eve, we know, as scripture tells us, she was deceived. He's still the master deceiver. He's still the lion that, that's seeking whom he may destroy. He's still trying to devour. But we see he is going to be put down. The dragon goes down in defeat. The shepherd, the great shepherd, rises up. And that's what we're seeing in this. In the head of the dragon is a star. That star is Rastavon in Hebrew. It means the head of the subtle. He is the most subtle of them all. He is the, the head poncho. The others are his false angels that, that followed him, that do his dastardly deeds, but he is the head. There's another star in his head that the name means a long serpent or a dragon. So again, we see the serpent as sly. We see him as a creeping deceiver. I think I'm still in 2 Corinthians. I'm a, if you are too, go to chapter 11. And in 2 Corinthians 11, we're going to look at verse 14. And we read there about him also. It says, No wonder, for even Satan, Satan, disguises himself as an angel of light. He makes himself look good. He confused or, or deceived Eve by looking good. He knows how to entice by looking good. He's not going to come like our little comics, a, a, a devil, you know, red devil, horns, pitchfork, tail, showing how he's evil. No, he's going to come looking good. He's going to deceive the people. You don't need to go the Lord's way. Can he tell you that you die if you eat this fruit? Oh, you won't die. You'll be as smart as him. You'll know good and evil. Well, you know what? He was right. They'd know good and evil, but he was wrong. They would not be as smart as God. They would not become equal to God. But the same way he wanted that, that pride in him was found in man also. And he continues trying to destroy by stealth. He knows he's going down. If we can read it, you don't think he knows what his future is also. You don't think he knows the battle is going to be lost. But does he have... The right attitude then and say, oh, I should turn from my wicked ways. I should humble myself before God. No, he's, he's out to get as many as he can to go with him, to be pulled down with him. Does he think there's any doubt that he has? I think he does. I think he has the destiny to think he can, he can thwart God's plan. He can win. And so he's going about to do it. And I think the thought probably is, and if I can't win, then let me take down as many as I can. Yeah, exactly. Have you ever known someone like that, seen someone in, in some, you know, doing something, and they just want to take as many down as they can? I think of um, the lie. When we talk about how he puts out the lie, we know that these um, that become the, the um, 
suicide bombers. Sorry, couldn't think of the name. The suicide bombers. I'll take you to Israel. The suicide bombers in Israel, by the time they are ready to carry out, they are not thinking for themselves and weighing what they're doing. They've been so deceived, their mind has been so brainwashed by the evil, continually telling them, they think that when they strap on this, this belt that will blow themselves up, the more they take out, the better, because then they get a greater reward. They're promised at least 72 virgins in heaven. That's where they're going to wake up. So they're leaving this earth to go to a wonderful place, at least for the man. That's wonderful. And 11 virgins. And 72. Uh, 72, they're promised. How many? 72. 72 virgins. 72 virgins. Oh, wow. And they're going to wake up in torment. They're going to wake up in suffering forever. They are not going to wake up where they've been promised. But that's the lie of Satan. He knows they're going to go down at defeat. He doesn't care about them. He just wants them to take out as many as they can with him. That's this one who we're reading about. And that's why we're told in 1 Peter, 1 Kepha, his book uh, near the end of our New Covenant, chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Be of sober spirit. That doesn't mean don't drink. Of course, you don't want to drink and be under alcoholic influence either. But it's mean, meaning be, be serious-minded. Be thoughtful. Be on the alert. You have an adversary. Your adversary, who is that? This is a warning. Who is your adversary? The devil. He prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Have you ever watched the lions go after out in nature? They don't go after another lion when they're hungry. They go after the, the cattle, the sheep, whatever in the field. In, in the in the in the open that they go after the ones that are dragging behind the weak ones the ones that aren't strong and able to fight or run fast they go after the weak that's who they get that's what satan's doing let me find a weak one and he's going to pull as many down as he can how do we prevent that you come into that light you give yourself to the lord who puts his spirit within you to enlighten you now you are protected by him. You're his forever. You're sealed with his mark. Satan cannot get you. But he's still going to oppress you. He's still going to shoot his arrows at you and try to bring you harm and, and discourage you from following the Lord. But he is, I mean, how horrible to, to and put the carrot out that, oh, you're going to end up in, in heaven with all of these virgins, and you end up in fires of hell. You know, that's, that's just what a horrible, horrible um, master he is. He is the oppressor. He's the persecutor. He's uh, seen here, you know, the idea is that he's, he's assailing with his teeth and with his claws, or he's, he's spouting fire and fury. He's rushing to devour his prey. We read about that also in Revelation 12. Remember, he has a vendetta against Israel who brought forth Messiah. In his first coming, he has a vendetta against the followers of Messiah. In Revelation 12, verse 5, we have that Israel gave birth to the son, the male child, who will rule the nations. And so when he realizes that, verse 7 tells us there's war in heaven. Michael, Michael who is in relation to Israel, he is the angel for Israel. He and his angels were waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels raged war. What happened? We already read it, verse 9. The great dragon gets thrown down. The serpent of old is called the devil and Satan, who, said Satan, who deceives the whole world, thrown down, and his angels thrown down with him. So he goes down to feet. Like we said, we think he probably has the audacity to think that he can overrule God and God's plan the same way when he tried to bring himself up against God and he's going to try that again after that millennial reign when he's released for a short time. He goes through the whole world pulling out those who have been deceived again, who are choosing to follow him, those who are rebellious in their hearts against the true, one true and living God. And he comes up against God to dethrone God, to dethrone Yeshua the Messiah, to put himself on the throne. And this is when God says enough is enough and he gets cast into the lake of fire forever where he deserves to be. The head also has a star that's called El Al Wad, Al Wade, A L, and a new word W A I D in Arabic, and it means destroyed. Again, we see him go down into feet. We see Genesis 3:15 promise him to be crushed 
the, the death blow, and we see Revelation, where we see Revelation 19, where Messiah comes back and puts him down, 20 where he's put into the abyss, and then 21, um, 21? Before 21, and 20, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, yeah, the great white throne, following after the thousand years in chapter 20, at the end of it, we see where he'll finally be cast into the lake of fire forever. Um, <clears throat> this this last one, this last star that I told you that, that means destroyed, was also the, the nebulous star to the dragon's eye in that day. Now, there are other names um, from the other languages. They all mean either the deceiver or the subtle, the fraudful, you know, causing fraud, one who's full of deceit, the humbled, brought down, and even the punished enemy. It's interesting that the Hebrew root for the word for the punished enemy takes us back to Shemot, to Exodus. When we look in Exodus 15:6. We're going to read at the battle cry, and uh, remember, this is the punished enemy. This battle cry, uh, your right hand, Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, destroys the enemy. When we see that, destroying the enemy, um, and it actually, I wanted, okay, I, I am in the right verse, but I also wanted where it's Micha Mocha Malim Yehovah which means, who is like unto thee, O Lord, our God. That was the battle cry of um, the Maccabeans when they won the battle for what we call Hanukkah today. We see the battle cry all the way back in the time of Egypt also. So again, we see that, that the name is the punished enemy of our God. So that's where our book ends. It ends with, with this dragon going down in defeat. Remember, our first book ends with him being cast down from heaven. Our second book, we'll see him bound. Our third book, we'll see him cast out forever, destroyed forever into the lake of fire. Okay, any questions? Didn't mean to catch you. <laughs> any questions in my Zoom land? I can't see everybody. The, the ones I can see, no hands are going up. Okay, so we are ready then for the second book. The second book is going to talk about the redeemed. Um, the, the first book, remember, talked about the Redeemer coming his first time in his suffering um, picture. The second book is talking about the redeemed, the people that he redeems, the result of his suffering. His suffering in, in the first book was not for nothing or for naught. It was to redeem man. And then our third book, we're going to see the Redeemer coming back in his glory. We're going to see him coming back to rule and reign. Okay, so in the second book, we're going to look at the fruit of his work. We're going to see his mediatorship, if I can call it that. We're going to see him as mediator. We're going to see the formation, the condition, and the destiny of his body. His body is what we call today the called out assembly. Some call it the church, but I want to make sure you don't go to any specific church when I use that word. This is the body of believers. M Messiah Christ is our head. We are his body. So this is we who have been redeemed, and we're going to see all of that under this book. Uh, the first, we remember, we'll have um, four major constellations in this book. And we'll have the minor ones underneath each also because our 12 are divided into the three overall books. So we've had four. Now we're going to be looking at number five, which is going to be Capricornus. Um, go just past Sagittarius where you were on that, um, the path that's on the, ecl the, the, the ecliptical. I have trouble with that word, getting ecliptical. that first C in there. Um, and you're going to see right, right by the wing of Sagittarius. There you go. Upside down for Roger where, you know, where he's at. There we go. I thought he could turn it around. Okay. So you see Capricornus. Chapter 1 in the second book is the sign of Capricornus. We call it Capricorn today. Originally it was Capricornus. And chapter 1 is their blessings, meaning the redeemed, their blessings procured. Procured means that, that you get something, um, you earn it, you, you, um, you had to work for it. it. It wasn't something that was just handed to you. The Redeemer had to work for uh, us for our blessings. Our blessings are found in Him. 
the work he had to do, shed his blood for us. So that's what we're going to be seeing. When we look at Capricornus, we're looking at 51 stars that they use to make up this shape. It's called the sea goat, S-E-A. The sea goat, like a goat in the sea, or the fish goat. That's because the head is of a goat and the tail is of a fish. So it, it's, um, don't look at Cetus, go, go up from Cetus, where, where, there you go, right in front of number eight. Yeah, that's Taurus, but the little one. The little one is, there you go, see the head of the goat? There you go, Roger's on it right now. Okay, that's the head of a goat. And then when you see the, the tail, um, we're gonna see the tail of the fish. I'll tell you what, Roger, if you go to the pictures that I brought up for us, I think it'll show it better, okay? It's showing um, Pisces. Full you know fish. what? I knew something was wrong. We've got the wrong one there, Roger. Go back to the chart because when I look down here, I can see the tail of the fish and I see more of a goat's That's the head. Fish um, we were pointing out There's areas. No, two fishes. no, you want to go to number five. You were looking at number oh. eight. I oh, knew there was something fishes. wrong. Yeah. yeah, the fishes are something else. We'll, we'll study the fishes, but not yet. And we were looking at Aries there, but if you go to there, you go, see Capricornus, oh, yeah. now you see the head of the goat and the fish tail, now it's much more clear, okay? And see the wing is what the head of the goat is um, almost touching, the wing off of Sagittarius. Oh, okay. So, okay, so now we can see it better. Now we've got the sea goat, S-E-A, the sea goat, the fish goat, the head of a goat, the tail of the fish. In Latin, Capricornus means goat. Oh. No, I didn't even know that was a fish tail. I just thought it was a, a fan. <laughs> it looks like a fan. Yeah, it's not a, it's not the body of a goat there at the end. Okay. The Babylonian star catalog, the catalog that they have of names of the stars and all that from Babylonian times. Um, they they have this catalog, whatever you want to call it, this book uh, that goes back, dates back to about a thousand BC. They called it the goat fish. They just simply put it in the other order. They called it the goat fish. Okay, what we are seeing is the goat is the animal that was um, used for the atonement, slain for the atonement for the redeemed. Let me show you that from scripture. We're going to Leviticus. That's by Ephra in our Hebrew. Leviticus, we're going to look at chapter um, um, 16. Chapter 16, and we'll look at verses 5 through 10. And verse 5 in particular gives us our name, but let me give you the background here. In verse 5, he shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats as a sin offering, which is for himself, so that he may make atonement for himself and his household. He shall then take the two goats, present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of the meeting. Aharon Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aharon shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. What I've just read to you has to do with the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. Remember verse 5, it said it was for an atonement, and I think it repeated it there at the end to one of the other verses I read it also. Anyway, if you're familiar with it, at the temple or at the tabernacle, <coughs> two goats would be presented to the high priest. The high priest would cast lots. The lot would fall on one to be put to death as a sin offering. The other would be taken out to the wilderness and let go free. It's called the scapegoat. That's how we get our name scapegoat. When they're a scapegoat, it's like they escape with the punishment they deserved. Mm -hmm. They get to go free. They're, they're cast out. And that scapegoat was to never be seen again. Our sins were never to be remembered again. When they are, are dealt with by the Lord, when he put his blood in our place, it's, it washes our sins away forever. They don't come back. I, I love that they I'd don't come back. Than the one that sacrificed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but the goat of the atonement was slain so that the people could be redeemed. Now, our second book, the one that we're on right now, opens with the goat. It's going to close with the ram. That's where I think we were looking um, when we thought we had the goat. <coughs> okay. Both the goat and the ram are the two animals of sacrifice in our scriptures. The two middle chapters, because we're going to have four chapters in our second book, you have four chapters in each book. 
the, the remember chapter for each um, sign. The two middle chapters are both connected with fishes. You already saw the fishes. I told you we'd be talking about what they meant soon. They're going to represent the people for whom the atonement was made. So you've got atonement on one end, you've got atonement on the other, and you've got the people that the atonement was made for in the middle of this book. Okay, we'll talk more about that as we unfold it. The Hebrew name is Gedi. It means the kid. You know, a, a goat's child is called a kid. And it's interesting that in En Gedi is the wild mountain goats. So they're still there to this day. I saw them when I was in Israel. In Arabic, it means cut off. And when we read here that the one is cut off, the one is put to death as a sin offering, the other is cast out to never be seen again, it fits the name um, all the way through. The other names for the stars in this are the one that means the sacrifice slain, or another means the slaying. And the description of our goat is this. The goat is bowing its head as if he's falling down in death. So he's supposed to be kind of looking down. He's defeated. But the tail of the goat is the fish's tail. The goat is unable to rise. Notice how his feet are under him. He can't get up in that position. This is, I've fallen and I can't get up again. Okay? But the tail is showing fullness of life. It's showing vigor. It's pointing up. It's not pointing down. So the living fish, the fish is signifying the regeneration of the persons, that they're regenerated into a new life. Let me show you Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. Just a couple of verses there. Go to Matthew 13 and go to verse 37. Matthew 13 and verse 37 we read, long ways down, and he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest <coughs> is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So we see that there are those who are saved, there are those who are lost. This is going to be a picture of those who are redeemed. We're going to see they're the ones that get this newness of life. So, the living fish, in essence, proceeds from the dying goat. Yet, there's only one body. They're not two separate ones, okay? There's only one body. Let me get my whole point out before you say, this doesn't make sense. I think it will if you follow me to the end, 1 Corinthians 12. We read 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. We read there, for just as the body is one and yet has many parts, and all the parts of the body, there are many, are they, though they are many, are one body, so also is Messiah. When we talk about being the called out assembly, when we talk about being the church, when we talk about being the congregation that is in Messiah, that he's our head, we're many in that body. But we're one body. Even though we're many, we're talked of like one. Okay, so it, they're forming one body here. Ephesians 5.23. Let me give you scripture to back up scripture. Ephesians 5.23. In, in Ephesians 5, we know that Messiah is setting down headship and he's showing the head uh, over all is he himself. Um, in verse 23 or 25, which did I want? 23. We read the husband is the head of the wife. That doesn't mean he's greater. It doesn't mean he's to club his wife. It's just simply that he's given that headship. That's responsibility. He's to oversee her and take care of her and protect her and provide for her. And how is he to do it? He, the, the husband is the head of the wife as Messiah is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. So if the head of the called out assembly, the church, protects that body, takes care of that body, and even gave himself for that body, that's what the husband's to be like to the wife. He's even supposed to be willing to lay down his life for his wife. So it has nothing to do with a subjection and a submission <coughs> and a, your, your a mat under my feet. But as we humbly submit ourselves to the will of the Father in heaven or to the will of Messiah, in that marriage picture, the wife is to be able to submit to the head of her husband 
or to her head, which is her husband, because he's caring for her in that same way that Messiah carries, cares for us. So it's not a, a put down, it's not a second class, there's, there's nothing of that in there, but there's everything about um, giving oneself completely, and that there could be no greater love than that. Look at John 17. John 17, and we'll look at verse 21. John 17 and verse 21 says that they may be that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Okay, tongue twister to jump into the middle, but we have Messiah talking, and he's talking about he himself as the Son of Man, and he's talking about his Father who is in heaven. He's talking about Jehovah God, and he is talking about being Yeshua the Son, okay? And he's saying, the Father in heaven and the Son here on earth are one. The Father's in me, I'm in the Father. Anyone who tells you, and there's a, a huge following that says that the Lord never claimed to be equal with the Father, what does this verse mean then? I'll, I'll read the beginning of it again. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So also that they also may be in us. How can that be if they're not one and the same? We know that what we are seeing is this one body that just as the Lord said he came to do the will of the Father, that he is, the, he is equal with the Father, we are brought into his body in that same way that we are one with him. The same way a marriage becomes one is the completeness. Now, if you see that, in this and you remember back in Matthew 4 when Messiah was starting his earthly ministry he called those to follow him that obviously had some of them in any way had been hearing him knowing that he was showing himself to be an amazing rabbi uh, one that they wanted to follow and we find that that he called them verse 19 of chapter 4 he said to them follow me and I will make you fishers of people, of men, people. of people, depending on whether you're reading Old King James or what version, okay? In this way, fishers are good. They're to be the fishers of men. That's the good way. Now, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, chapter 16, we're going to see the other side of that. We'll read in Jeremiah, whoops, in Jeremiah 16. Go to verses 15 and 16, and here we read, But as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he banished them, for I will restore them to their own land, which I gave to their fathers. Behold, I'm going to send for many fishermen, declares the Lord. They will fish for them, and afterward I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them from every mountain and every hill and from the cliffs of the rocks. Okay, if, they, if they're fishing for men, they're bringing them in to be one with Messiah. The hunters, hunters kill. Hunters would be the negative, and that would be the judgment, that those who came against, those who would not believe, they, they will be hunted down for their judgment, which they deserve, where the others are being um, brought in as fishers of men. So when we look at this, the new life that comes, it comes through the fish, as we come into new life with the Messiah who gave his life for us, like the goat, the sacrificed atonement, we'll come into that newness of life. We'll get that vigor of life. We'll get that renewing, that regeneration um, that we need. When the promised seed was born, I should pause for a minute, let you get past that. But I'm into a new thought, okay? When the promised seed was born, when Messiah was born, the sun was in the sign of Capricornus, okay? Now, we know that Messiah came, was born in his earthly human body in the fullness of time. Galatians 4.4 tells us that, that he came in the fullness of time. That means God's perfect timing. Messiah was promised for hundreds of years, for thousands of years, really, before he came. He came at the right time. He didn't come too early. He didn't come too late. What's interesting is if this was the time when he was born, if, we, if we're right in that, then the nights were at their darkest, they were at their longest when Yeshua was born. 
The days began immediately to lengthen when the true light came into the world. So it's just an interesting note. The sun was in the sign of a sacrificial animal, um, Aries the ram, at the hour of crucifixion. But at the birth, he was in, um, in, the, the, in Capricornus, and we know that this is a picture of the one slain who brings us the vigor of new life. So just very interesting. We cannot say uh, for a shadow of doubt we know exactly when the Lord was born. There's good evidence for him to have been born in December, even though there are those who want to say contrary. They're, they have good evidence on their side to put him in the fall months being born. We some don't in know. Spring too. And, and some in the spring also, yes. Uh, so we don't know really. And in fact, I'll bring you into the star Bethlehem. Um, maybe I'll bring that out now, and then next week we can take the decons. I think that might be the best way to do it. Um, the Star of Bethlehem, I'll explain in just a moment, but let me say that to you again. If this timing is right, and we know this to be fact, whether we see it in the stars or not, we know it to be fact, that, that he came, he was born into this life to bring us the newness of life. But it's interesting that if you were born in the, the month of December, this was when the sun was in the, in the, um, what's the, what are these things? The constellation, Capricornus, the picture of the goat who dies, who's slain, the goat of atonement, and the picture of the fish coming up into newness of life. When Yeshua died on the cross, when he shed his blood, the sun was in the sign of Aries, the ram, and this was the other sacrificial animal that I talked to you about who was giving his life, the, the lamb that gave his life. Remember Revelation 12 talks about the lamb who looks as though he'd been slain because he was slain, but we know he resurrected because he had the power to take his life back up again. Just an interesting um, phenomena that could be true. Now, we all know that there is a star um, associated with the birth of Messiah. We know that the wise men uh, followed his star, Matthew 2.2. 2. They came because of his star. They didn't come because of a star and they wondered about it. They came because it was his star. And we have other hints about this star in Matthew 2 also. But we, we know that the wise men who came didn't know everything, okay? So... What is called the day the star of Bethlehem is we're referring to the star that the Magi saw when they said they come to see, he, they saw his star. Let me read it. I'm saying it so poorly. <clears throat> Matthew 2 2. Okay? Uh, I guess I really have to read one to make it make sense. Now, after Yeshua, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king. Behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Okay? They saw his star. Now, one line of thought is they, the star rose, they followed the star, and they came to Jerusalem. The other is that they saw the star, they knew what the star signified, that the king had been born, they knew as the king of Israel, so they set out to come to Israel to see the king. And that's why they end up in Jerusalem. They didn't know everything because if they had known Micah's prophecy, Micha, they would have known that he would be born in Bethlehem, not in Jerusalem. But anyway, they saw a star, and apparently the idea that we're given is that star was mobile that star moved, okay? And we're, we know that this has to be supernatural in one way or another. So there are several that went looking from the little bit we have in scripture into the astronomy of the stars and have tried to figure it out. And I'm going to show you why we do not take anything that's not written in scripture and say, this is truth, this is dogmatic, this is it, and this is the only way it can be. And so we know unequivocally he was born in this month, on this day, at this time. We can't do that. We don't have that in Scripture, and we have good views of different things that happen at different times. So I'm going to give them to you. You can make up your own mind. I will tell you that I have left my mind open. 
I'm not going to say, oh, I believe this view because all of them have problems and all of them have good points. All I know and all that matters is he was born. Right. He definitely was born to be the atonement. He definitely brings us newness of life. So all of that fits. Whether it was the right sign that was up there at the right time, I can't tell you, but it makes a lot of sense. I can tell you that. So let me just give it to you now, uh, and you'll see. And that's why I tell you also, when we go into the astronomy and we study and we have these names, remember, we're given outlines, we're given sketches. You can draw different animals. You can see things differently. I'm not saying that you have to believe everything dogmatically, but the overall picture we know is there. The heavens declare the glory of God. We know the glory is Yeshua Jesus. We know Abraham saw Yeshua's day, and he believed and he was considered righteous. We know to be considered righteous, he saw death, burial, and resurrection for his sins. So we know this is there, that we are unequivocally, dogmatically claiming. What we can't say is, oh, I know he was born in December, or I know he was born in spring, or I know he was born in fall. I know he was born, yeah, that's all that <laughs> and that's all that matters, okay? It like, doesn't matter what day you worship on, just so you worship. <laughs> right, right. There are different days that people honor for different reasons. Okay, so let's go back into the stars, though, and see what we can find. Okay, there, the, the, the Magi observed the star of Bethlehem. We'll call it that because the star comes to Bethlehem. We know it comes and it stands over the place where the child was, okay? Now... We know, and let, let, me, let me give you that overall picture real quick. Herod tells them, go, you know, he, 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 they come to Jerusalem. Where's the king? They're expecting the king to be at the palace. The king isn't at the palace because he wasn't born to be king. He was born to be the suffering servant. So Herod calls in the, the wise men, the astronomers, the astrologers, you know, not all of faith, but he calls them all in. What's this about a king of the Jews that's supposed to be born? Oh, well, we know. That's in those prophecies that the Jews have. Well, where is he supposed to be born? He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. That's about five miles south of, of Jerusalem at this time. Mm -hmm. Today, Bethlehem and Jerusalem almost meet because there's been such a buildup on both. All right? But at that time, it was about five miles south. So, Herod is concerned. He's got to be a king. He's got a rule. He can't have a usurper coming up. He doesn't want a threat. We see all the time when kings came into rule, they killed off anybody who could be a potential threat. So he's told that this birth of this baby is the one that is supposed to be king. Well, he's going to get rid of his possible potential threat. So he's going to put out the declaration for the babies to be killed. Now, if the wise man, he told them, go find the baby, then when you've found him and you've, you've done your thing, you've worshipped him, then come back and tell me because <coughs> I want to go worship him too. Lie, lie, lie. Well, God doesn't let the, the Magi go back and tell them. <coughs> he reveals to them in a dream not to do that, and they don't come back. Now, if this all happened very, very fast, then Herod would have been able to say, put the babies to death, six months old, and then <laughs> the fact that he tells them to put to death all the male children two years and under, time has passed before he realizes that the Magi are not coming back, that they're not going to tell him. Also, we mistake because we put it in our lovely nativity scenes. And <laughs> don't worry about that. The scene isn't there to be perfect. The scene is to remind us of what we're celebrating at Christmas time so that we don't get caught up in the secular of the world. But the scenes put the wise men at the stable. The wise men did not come to the stable. The scripture is very clear <laughs> that they came to the house where the young child was rather than going to the stable where the baby was. Remember, they saw his star and they set out to follow if that star came up at the same time that Yeshua Jesus was born, it took them time to travel, to come to Jerusalem, time to go down to Bethlehem, and time to go back home before Herod realizes, hey, they didn't come back and tell me. And they're not anywhere to be found. He couldn't just send an entourage down to Bethlehem to where the Magi are worshiping and say, hey, where is he? 
So enough time has transpired that he throws out the net of two years to cover the time. And again, we don't know. We don't know how fast they came. We don't know if the star appeared ahead of his birth so that they came closer to his actual birth. I doubt that because why do we need two years then? So I tend to think they saw his star, got their act together, packed up, they're going on the road. And by the way, it was not just three wise men. They pictured that because of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That was the three gifts. But back in that day, it would have been a whole entourage that traveled. It would have been many regally on their camels with much. They would have had their servants. They would have had those to take care of the camels. They would have had those to take care of them. It would have been a big entourage. You're not going to move fast by camel. You're not going to move fast with that many people. You're going to have to stop. You're going to have to camp. You're going to have to cook your food. You're going to have to sleep. You're going to, you know, it, it would take time. How long it took, we don't know. But I want you to see the time passed. Now, we do know, or we do believe, and I think, I think really we're right on target, how the wise men knew, okay? They are wise men who are astronomers. They're in the area of the east. When Daniel, Daniel was taken into captivity, he was taken into the east in captivity. He was taken to Babylon. They called it Persia. We call it Iraq and Iran in that area today. Excuse me. Okay? We know that Daniel influenced the astrologers in Babylon. It was not the other way around. They set out to make Daniel and his men forget all about their upbringing, their God, their way of worship, even change their name so that they'd have no association. But we see very quickly Daniel is able to interpret the vision, the dream, and the, give the dream and its meaning, which the wisest could not. They were going to be put to death. Daniel spares their lives. You don't think they appreciated him, and you don't think that they said to him, how did you know? You know, who is your God? I believe fully that there were those in Babylon that in our vernacular today got saved. They came to saving faith and believing in the one true and living God and the plan that he gave of this one who would be the savior of the world. They believed in him. They saw it in the stars revealed to them the same way Daniel had had it taught to him in the stars. So he was able to teach not that he got the dream from the stars. He got the dream from God. The stars may be a, one of the ways God speaks to us, his written word, another way that he speaks to us, but it is God speaking. It's no hokey pokey. We can believe in the stars. Oh, the stars tell us, oh yeah, when these stars rise, we do this, or we're like that. No, 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 no. Take it to the author, okay? So Daniel introduces them to the author who gave, them, gave him that wisdom. They carry that down. Not all of them, but God kept a strain that kept that truth. They pass it down to the next astronomer's generation and the next generation so that you get down from 586 B.C. down to almost zero, or there is no zero, almost to 1 A.D. A few years before, because even though our calendar says he was born at 1 A.D., he was born before himself. He was born in B.C. We're a few years off and we don't know how much. So anyway, that's how they knew. And they saw apparently what, what and we already talked about it, how Virgo was the sign, the male child, you know, went from the branch to the male child, that, that in Virgo they saw the, the son that would be born. We talked about how that may have risen on the, where they, it could be seen. Somehow, in some way, a star rose up that they knew indicated the king had been born. Now, I do believe that it came up in, and we haven't studied it yet, we'll get there. It came up, I believe, in Pisces, because Pisces is a constellation that speaks of Israel. And if it was the king of the Jews that was born, then it would be that it would have come up in Pisces. So when our sky moves and these things change and a new star came up, it was at the same time that the meridian came across the breast of the virgin, showing that she was now breastfeeding, she was nurturing the child that had been born. All of this information that they knew how to study is what sent them on this path to come down. They want to see the king of the Jews. We also know all the way back, long before Daniel, in uh, Numbers, Bud Midbar, Numbers 24, 
we have the pagan prophet Balaam, hired by Balak to curse the children of Israel. Balaam opens up his mouth to curse, and all he can do is bless. Several times this happens, God doesn't let him curse the people. But it's interesting that when he did this, um, Balak would get upset at him, you know, why are you blessing when I told you to curse? And he said, I can only speak the words God allows me to speak. He didn't believe in the true God, but he was controlled by the one true and living God. Well, that area, Balaam, Balak, that area, it is called the town of Pethor on the Euphrates River. It is near Persia. It's in the Babylonian area. So once again, we can see the hand of God at work in amazing ways that brought down prophecy and truth that Balaam even couldn't prophesy against um, the, the children of Israel. So we've got a background for Persia to know something about the hand of, of the living, the one true living God. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, and so he was manifested through the stars, just like Moses was through the burning bush. Okay, the burning bush is a good example of, of yes, of a manifestation of the Lord himself, yes. And so, yes, we're saying the same thing. The stars are showing that manifestation also, yes. God wasn't the burning bush, but he showed himself in that. The Shekhinah glory of God, the cloud pillar by day, the pillar of fire by night, that would lift, that would move, they would follow, all that. Those are manifestations that revealed God and his plan, the Lord and his plan, to man. Yes, that's a good way to put a pen. Yes, very good. Okay, now, in scripture, star is, does mean star. In the Greek, which is what we have for our New Testament, our New Covenant, it's the word aster. It's used 24 times, and it's always referring to, I'll call it a celestial body. It's referring to a star. Okay, so that would lead us to believe that the Bethlehem star is a star. It's not something else. It's not an angel. It's not... A planet, it's a star. Well, the planets are called stars. But you'll see what I mean, okay? Um, some are going to call it a supernova. You're going to see these different explanations. I'm trying not to complicate this. It could be one of two ways. It could be that the star appeared only to the Magi, the Magi who were watching for it, who had the technology and the equipment and the ability that they were the only ones who saw it, or it could be that, that everybody saw it, but they were the only ones that knew the significance of its meaning. But it's interesting because it's going to also go, not just get them to Jerusalem, whether they followed it to Jerusalem or not, they knew where to go, but it's going to take them from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Now, I already told you where Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, is in relation to Jerusalem. Do you remember what I told you? It's five miles away. Five miles in what direction? East. Nope. <laughs> good try, but nope. And you remember the five, good for you. South, okay? If you look at a map today, here's Jerusalem. <coughs> Down below Jerusalem on the map is Bethlehem. Bethlehem will always be south of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, the planets, the stars and all, move east to west. So the fact that this is going to move north to south is miraculous. It is showing a phenomena that is not normal. Okay, so no matter what you want to call this star in the end, and no matter what you want to think, it's miraculous hand of God pointing in the direction to what he wanted them to come see. Because of that, there are those who will feed right into what Pam just said, and they'll say it was the Shekinah glory, that they followed the glory just like the cloud and the, the pillar of fire at night in tabernacle days, that that's all this was. It was the Shekhinah glory of God. You know what? I can't argue with that. That could be right on target. I can also say God can use the stars as he did to declare all that we know he's declaring and make one be able to miraculously move north to south. If he made the stars, if he flung them out in space, if he put them in an order, if they're doing his purpose, what is it to him if one of those stars moves north to south? <laughs> you know. So again, I'm showing you how we have different thoughts and different views, and it doesn't matter what conclusion you come to as long as you don't go out on a limb and say, it has to be this way. Yeah. Because the only time we get to do that is when we can see it in the Word of God and say it.
we know that, the, for example, it says, there is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved except the name Yeshua, Jesus. So guess what? I'm climbing on my soapbox, and I'm saying it loud and clear. Muhammad, you can't save. Allah, you're dead. Buddha, you're dead. Hinduism, all the Eastern gods, all of the New Age, all of these who have made um, images, idols, none of those can save. And I will stand on that with my dying breath. And I'll be ushered into the presence of my God who saves because I'm coming in through the saving blood of Yeshua, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Now, if you don't like that, take it up with God. <laughs> because that's who you're arguing with. It's not that says Rochelle. It's not that says anybody else it, except for God himself. And anything that he is that exacting on, be that exacting on. Everything else, give grace for each other. We don't all have to agree everything. If you want to believe it was the Shekinah glory, fine. If you want to believe, no way it had to be a star, fine. It's okay. Just don't miss the point. He came into the world. He came into the world to be the sacrifice. He sacrificed him himself. He raised from the dead because he had the power to take his life back to him. And he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes into the Father but by me. Why is it so important to come to the Father? Because the Father is the creator of this all, along with the Son who created with him. But when you have created an entire world, when you have put man into your world, don't you have the right to put the rules there too? Don't you get to say, this is how it goes? When you become the creator, when you have made your own, when you have found a way to create, and to this day man cannot create, he thinks he can create, but he cannot create life. When you have, when you're in control, when you've made it, make the rules. And if you want the rules your own way, make them your own way. And if someone comes to argue, you can say, uh, 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 this is my world. <laughs> but I'll take you back to square one. The same way Satan can't create, all he can do is counterfeit. That's all you're going to be able to do too, is just counterfeit. You will never be able to create. Only God has that power. And he lovingly did it all for us. That's why I don't understand why they want to argue so badly against it, except for the fact of human pride. That says, I want to do it my way. I'm a good person. I've done good works. I've lived a good life. Why wouldn't God let me into his heaven? Well, it's the simple fact. You haven't lived perfect. And who is to say who's good enough? I can look at Jeanette and say, and pardon me for picking on you, but you're in my view. I can say Jeanette's lived an exemplary life. She is sweet and she is loving. She is helpful to her neighbor. She did this, she did that. She is a good person. She should be allowed into heaven. But somebody else is going to come along and say, I know Pam. Pam did a thousand more things than Jeanette did. Pam's the one that should get into heaven, and Jeanette shouldn't because she didn't do enough good. Where would you ever draw the line? And if it's a matter of our good works, how would we ever know that we've done enough? We could live a lifetime trying to do it, and somebody else did one more good work than us, and it's only the one who does enough. Yeah, I mean, how it would leave us so insecure. It would leave us with no standard, no judgment. Where is the fairness in that? That would be the same way of saying, okay, well, um, and I'm going to pick on myself because I don't want to say this to anybody else, but let's say I had two children, and one child committed murder and one child didn't. You know what? There was a woman named Eve who was in that problem, wasn't she? <laughs> and so this one child, this child is so bad, this child should be thrust out, but this child is good, so this child gets to go in. Who gets to judge that? Who gets to say that? And then maybe, maybe I'm going to make a world that murder's okay in that world. Or maybe not murder, because maybe everybody will agree murder's wrong. But, but let's just say, you know, because God sees all sin as equal. If you break the law at one point, you're guilty of it all. So let's say that, that you lived, Jeanette lived that great life that I told you, but oh, she got in her car going home from class state, and she went one mile over the speed limit. <laughs> She's a sinner. <laughs> you see how foolish it would be that we would have no standard. The same way I cannot accept 
any view that does not believe in the total inerrant word of God. If we cannot trust every single word, then who gets to say which words are true and which words are not true? We would not have an answer that we, we'd have to stand in fear and live in fear. I hope I'm right. I hope I'm right. Well, God doesn't leave it open to that. He makes it so clear. From cover to cover, it says the same thing. Only through Yeshua's shed blood is anyone saved. And everyone is saved through that shed blood who chooses to apply it to their lives. So the murderer and the one who just tried to live a good life but broke the speed limit, they both are saved in that blood. And that is what is the, the critical for this entire world. Because when we leave this world, we will face God. There will be a day of judgment. We will either face him in heaven for our reward, because we're in heaven and we're going to get reward for the good that we have done, or we will face him as the judge who is saying why we're not allowed into his heaven, because we rejected the way that he made open. We rejected the free gift that he gave. No one will be able to point a finger at God and say, well, it's your fault. You didn't, you didn't educate me enough. Or you didn't bore me in the right time or the right place. God will be able to show through all of time how every, all the way through time, man had opportunity. He never left it open for chance. He never left it open for confusion. So this is our God, and this is what we stand on. And that is why it's so important to know the Word of God. And why I say if you can find fault in it, then I'll throw it out, and I'll get off my soapbox, and I won't go there for the rest of my life, but I know you'll never find a mistake. You won't find a mistake scientifically. You won't find this mistake mathematically. Archaeology will prove the word of God time and time again. I can give you example after example. Those who want to say, well, the scientists show us that it can't be this way. It has to be that way. I will show you scientists that are just as respected, who have authority in the scientific world, who will show you how science agrees with the Bible, doesn't disagree all the way through. This is why I can be so secure, so strong, and get on my soapbox, and I've gone way off from our star of Bethlehem, and I don't know why, but I just want you to know, this is where you'll see me go out on that limb, is when I can say chapter and verse, thus saith the Lord. Where I can't, I'm going to give that room and that freedom. So, did the star appear, and they followed the star all the way, and, and the star was a star, it could be. Did the star appear only in the east? They knew what it meant, went to Jerusalem, and then the Shekinah glory appeared and showed them how to find it. That could be. We have these different views, and these views are all good. Um, what I want to give you in a nutshell real quickly is a couple of the different views. Um, I want to find them and get into them real quick. Okay, there's some that say it was a supernova, or a comet or a conjunction of the, the planets, okay? A supernova doesn't fit because a supernova would be a bright star, but it disappears very quickly and it doesn't travel. So supernovas are out, okay? The, the comet has the same problem. A comet is so orderly. And, and someone said, yeah, the tail pointed right to where they were to go. Well, if this were true, you know how we know when Halley's Comet will come in the future? We can look back through the time corridor and know when Halley's Comet was there. And we can find the proof of it in the, the recordings that are given by historians and scientists and so forth through the years. So that we know, I think Halley's Comet is every 76 years, if I remember right. We know when it would appear. And it did not appear at the time of Yeshua's birth. So that can be thrown out. And by the way, we don't know the exact year, but the comet, Halley's Comet, didn't appear any time in the, the realm of the years that, that Yeshua Jesus had to have been born, nor did any other comet, not just Halley's, but no other comet. So there is a conjunction of planets, and that's one of the things I want to bring out to you. It could have been um, this conjunction. Okay, um, there's two views here, and I want to give them fast because I don't think it's important enough to pick up next week. Um, let me give you the one that I can read in front of me right now. This one's called a triple conjunction. It was three separate conjunctions of the same two planets, which were Jupiter and Saturn, and it occurred in a one-year period. So three different times within one year, these two planets came together. 
Now, they, they do it so it can be predicted they're going to do it again, but not on a regular time, like it's every 50 years or something like that. The time changes. So there was this conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in 7 BC. It happened in the constellation of Pisces, which again is the sign for Israel. And it happened in the months of May and in September and in December. Interesting, that's the three theories of when Messiah may have been born. Okay, but here's what they're saying that um, if they set out when it happened the first time in May, they could have been to Jerusalem by September and they could have been to um, the, the house by December. You can see that and you can say it. The problem with this is that it happened in 7 BC and there was a conjunction of these planets also in 6 BC, not three times, but still they were colliding at that time. Um, because it was in the sign of Pisces, it could easily be pointed to as a time of his birth. But 7 and 6 BC are a little too early for it also. Then there's this other theory that um, happened, but it happens um, in 1 BC. And I'm trying to find it real fast. Oh, okay. It is this, that the planet Jupiter passes through a series of conjunctions over the course of two years. And they say that indicates that Jupiter would be the star of Bethlehem because Jupiter is considered a royal star and it came into conjunction with Regulus, which is the king star, the star that, that shows kingship. It was the brightest star in the constellation of Leo, Leo being the lion that, that represents our, our lion of the tribe of Judah, even though he didn't come as lion. But so basically it's saying the royal planet approach the royal star in the royal constellation that represents Israel and that this all happened you know together at the same time so Jupiter was so close to Regulus that it would have been bright it also talks about how and, and I don't want to get too technical but there's a point where um, it comes into view and it goes out of view because of the way it's rising on the horizon and the way it's setting. And so that would be why the, the Magi lost sight of it in Jerusalem and then it reappeared again. The problem with all this, see that one sounds really good, okay? <laughs> but the problem with this is it all happened in 1 BC. Now you'll say, well, that's okay. We don't know exactly when Yeshua Jesus was born. Well, if our historians are accurate, Herod died in 4 BC. So Yeshua Jesus had to be born before Herod died. So if all the this conjunctions that came together, Jupiter, the royal star, and you know, and all of that, it happened after Herod had died, then we've still got a problem. So bottom line, we have a problem with every theory. Do we know what the star of Bethlehem was? Can we say it dogmatically? No. But we do know a star appeared that the Magi knew stood for the king of Israel had been born. They came to see him. God miraculously brought them not only to Jerusalem, but brought them south to Bethlehem to see with the young child where he was. And then God told these wise men not to go back and tell Herod and sent them on their way home a different route so that Herod wouldn't know that this big entourage had left. Then God awakened the earthly father, not the sperm donor, but the earthly father of Yeshua Jesus and said, get your wife, get your child, and get out of town because the king wants to kill him. So we know Yosef fled down into Egypt. We know there was a prophecy, and I'll have to look up the, the reference because it doesn't come to mind immediately, that um, Messiah would come out of Egypt. This is how he comes out of Egypt. It wasn't that he was born in Egypt. He's not king. Well, he is king of Egypt because he's king of the world. But he's king of the Jews. He was born in Beit Lechem, the house of bread, because he's the bread of life. But he fled to Egypt uh, until Herod was dead, and then he could come back, and he grew up in Nazareth all to fulfill prophecy. How do I know the Bible is the word of God? You can throw everything else out if you want. Prophecy. Every single prophecy has been fulfilled exactly or we know is yet to be fulfilled. 500. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't miss, it doesn't, you can dot the I's, 
<laughs> you can cross the T's. No, we don't. No, we don't. There I mean, was, during the tribulation. There's a lot during it, but not 500, I don't believe. Not 500. I don't believe so. And, and some say it was only 300 in Yeshua's lifetime, but then there's the prophecies prior. I don't care what number you put on it. It is phenomenal. Let me just say in closing, and I know I'm out of time. I'm supposed to be concluding at 3.30, and I didn't do it today. Sorry. But in, if one person fulfilled eight prophecies, just eight, take it down from the 300 plus and bring it down to eight, one person who could fulfill eight is 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 with 17 zeros. The chance of one in 10 with 17 zeros after of one person fulfilling eight. Now take it to 49 prophecies. We've not even come near the 100 mark, and it's 10 to the, the 35th or the 37th power. It is so phenomenal. Next week I'll start. I'll read you the, the scientific way of explaining it. The easy way that I can remember is if you took the state of Texas, you covered it in silver dollars two feet deep. You put an X on one silver dollar stirred up the whole state of Texas, you hid that silver dollar somewhere in, in the state of Texas. You blindfolded a man in a plane in the sky. You let him parachute out down into the Texas and you told him, walk through Texas. Walk as little or as long as you want. When you feel like it, reach down, pick up one silver dollar. Your chance of picking up that one with the X on it is 10 to the 17th power. Just to the 17th power. That's the chances. You got a better chance of winning the lottery, everybody. Right. Now, don't you dare go out and buy a ticket and say Michelle said so. <laughs> but this is the phenomena of prophecy. Anything that can be that exact, that can tell it so far in advance, that can be so accurate that, that they argue later and say that had to have been written after the fact because it was too historically accurate, and then they find and can date where it was written before and it's known fact, then it's not history written after, it's prophecy written before. And that's what happened with the book of Daniel. He was called the historian. He wasn't, or uh, I'm sorry, he was called the prophet, not the historian, by Yeshua Jesus himself. This is why I stake my life on it, my future, where I'm going when I leave this world. The Bible is B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. I want to know where I'm going, and I want to know I'm going to hit the mark, and I know it because God said it. So I'm going to wrap it up on that note. Next week I will start with the, the phenomena of fulfilling prophecy because, again, if you want to argue everything else, argue prophecy with me. When you can find a prophecy that has failed, I'll shut up. <laughs> as hard as that would be, I would have to shut up. I would have no more words to say. But I know you'll never be able to do that because God's word never fails. And he said not one word would pass away, not one jot, not one tittle, till everything had been fulfilled. And he has done everything that had to be for, for Yeshua Jesus to be the Messiah. He came in the fullness of time and he kept those prophecies. The ones referring to the second coming, he will keep as exactly. The God who can do that is the God who saves. This is why we believe the word of God. So we kind of took a right turn, but we're on the right course. We need to know these. We need to be able to know why we're staking our lives on the word of God. Why should a book tell you how to live? You know, there's plenty of good books out there. Why should <laughs> this book be lifted up to that level? And why does nothing else come to that level? And they still twist it around. <laughs> yeah, but the truth of it, when you get to the truth, and any of these religions that have their own books, you read them, they pale in comparison, and not one of them is prophetically accurate, not oh, one right. other. Because I'm just starting to finish the David Jeremiah, The Last Hour. Oh. I've learned so much through that, but you're saying don't believe a lot of what it's saying. No, no, no. David Jeremiah is on, he believes the Word of God like I do. He's going to tell you what the Word of God says. Yeah. What I'm saying is the false religions. The, oh, the books of religion. the cults is what I'm saying. You read their, what they call their Bible. It, it, oh, yeah. it pales in comparison and it does not hold to the accuracy. So uh, forgive me for taking the right turn, but I think it's important for us to see it all, to know it all, to be defenders of our faith. If someone asks you, why do you believe the Bible? And you say, uh, I don't know, or well, because somebody told me to. Well, that, that's a pretty lousy excuse. If someone tells you to jump off the bridge, are you going to go do it? <laughs> but if you can say, 
My God has shown himself faithful. My God has shown himself true. My God has shown himself accurate. My God has never made a mistake in his word. My God has left his fingerprint. Let me show you and let me take you through some prophecies and let me show you the chance of this. I want any one of you to tell me, and I am going to shut up. I know I'm over time, but I want any one of you to tell me that you got to pick the place you were born. What? No hands? <laughs> you got to pick the place you were born. Did you do that? Did you tell your mom where to born you? No, you didn't. And you've got a pregnant Miriam who is living in Nazareth, North Israel. And it's not in the days of jets. It's not even the days of cars. It's donkeys, camels, and feet. <laughs> and you take a nine-month pregnant woman. Why is she going to go down to Bethlehem, Bethlehem? Not because she thinks, oh, this is an adventure I want to do when I'm nine months pregnant. I don't think a nine-month pregnant mom wants to walk out the front door and around the block. She's not. And here, she not only sets out on that journey, but makes it all the way to Bethlehem to be born where Micha, Micah said, the son of man, the, 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 God himself in human form would be born. Who could choose that? Did the baby in her tummy say, hey, get out of Nazareth, get on the road, get down to Bethlehem, I'm coming, hurry up. <laughs> and only God kept that baby from being born en route also, getting her all the way till she was there. And then why in the stable? I love it. Because where are little lambs born? They're born in the stable. The Lamb of God who was born to take away the sin of the world. On that note, let's close in prayer, and I'll let you make your comments. Pardon me for going over, but I love... Thank <laughs> Lord God, I'm ready to explode. Thank you for who you are, for revealing yourself in a language we could understand, proving it to be true, giving us no reason to doubt and every reason to believe. And Lord, thank you for those of us who have known and experienced we know a thousand times over in our life that you have proven yourself faithful and true in our lives. Lord, let us share that with others. Let them see and understand. May the deceiver, the dragon, the serpent be stopped from deceiving, from confusing, from lying. He flat out lies. Lord, may he be silenced and may we be able to share the, the very truth of your word which proves itself over and over and over again. Thank you that we can be secure, that we can know where we go when we leave this earth that we can know we will be in your presence, living with you forever, where it is glorious. No death, no sin, no separation, nothing except joy and gladness forever. Thank you that you have an eternal future for us to discover the wonders of our ineffable God. And we praise you and we give you all the glory. And we pray for any who hear this recording or, or uh, the, from us as we share, Lord, who aren't knowing yet, bring them into that saving faith that they can have the joy of their salvation also. To you, we praise you forever and ever. You are worthy to sit on the throne, the lamb who has been slain, who has become the, the ruler, the king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And we bow in humble adoration before you, singing hallelujah to our God. Amen. And amen. I think I'm out.